Um, nice to be out here. Uh, FBS is such a leader in the field of uh, innovative scholarship. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here. Um, so thank you for this invitation. Uh, I was thinking uh, about the last time I came here. <coughs> um, uh, I was a senior in high school when I was visiting colleges I came here. Um, and that got me thinking too, um, how I got into this field in the first place. Um, oh, let's see if this works, hold on a minute. Of air quality engineering. Um, actually, it's a little known story. The way I got into this was from a typo on my college application. Um, I wanted to go air, into air quality engineering, but um, <clears throat> what, I, what I really intended to go into was a different field, which is hair quality engineering. Now, this is an area where there's tremendous opportunity for engineers to make a real difference in the world. And this is a topic I've been passionate about since I was a kid, um, as evidenced by this picture here. Um, I could really have um, used some work there, and actually I've been into this for quite a long time, um, even from my younger days right there. Um, you can tell I'm a child of the 70s by the mismatched plaid, slight bell bottom going on. Um, turns out there's not hair quality engineering that you could study as a topic, so then I switched to the nearest thing, which was air quality engineering, and I'll make that switch now. So thanks for coming. Um, I think uh, if you saw the title of my talk, kind of a natural response would be something like this. This is kind of how I respond, which is, you know, really air pollution kills, is, is that right? Um, I, I study this topic, and I'm constantly surprised every day by how strong are the health effects of air pollution. And so what I want to talk about today is how we might use that information about the health effects of air pollution in setting our air quality management goals and our air quality management actions. So I'm going to begin with just sort of how do we know about the health effects of air pollution. This is probably a familiar picture to uh, those of you who work with Michelle Bell. Um, and this is one of the original slides that are one of the kind of the places that many people start from, which is the London fog. So this was um, a week or two episode when uh, in London, this was in 1952, there may be people here in the audience who remember this happening and made uh, news around the world. Uh, the air pollution built up and up. People were using coal for heating and the air was very stagnant for a couple of weeks and the concentration got very high. So this is a picture from midday in London. Um, there's all kinds of wonderful stories from people who lived through this episode and you know, kind of abandoned their cars in the streets because the pollution was so dense they couldn't see where they were going to. Um, I've heard stories from um, uh, police officers who were trying to get around, and it was so dark, they enlisted the help of blind people to help them get around, because for those people who were blind, the fact that you couldn't see didn't matter so much. Um, there were enormous health effects from this high concentration episode. Um, interestingly, the medical community was not the first one to notice. Um, it were the undertakers and the florists, because there was such a rise uh, in, in the, the mortality rates. So uh, here's some numbers around this. Um, people have reanalyzed this. Uh, Michelle has looked at this as well. So here's this episode looking at the days of, of December, um, and you see in gray uh, this, this uh, smog event. Um, and so the two things that were measured at the time, smoke and sulfur dioxide, where the concentrations went up quite a bit. And then you see in red death rates. So I'll notice two things. One is you don't need any complicated statistics to pull out the signal from the noise here. There's a several fold increase in mortality rate during this episode, really strong signal there. And the other thing to notice is that when the episode ends, the death rates don't go back to their original level right away. It actually takes a few weeks till they come back down to the original episode. So there's a, a short-term effect, and there's kind of this intermediate-term effect as well. So following from this incident, and incidents like it, there are some others elsewhere in Europe and, and some in the US as well, the thinking around air pollution was, we have to avoid these really high concentration episodes. And if we do that, if we keep the concentrations lower, then we'll be safe. And that's what's codified in the Clean Air Act. We have the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, the NACs, which is uh, EPA is supposed to set the standards um, that we, if we stay below, then uh, we will be safe. And that was a reasonable thinking following this kind of incident um, up until the publication of this article in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is the Harvard Six City Study. Uh, so what they did is they tracked uh, long-term health effects of air pollution. Not the short-term health effects like we just saw in the, in the London example, but the long-term health effects. So here are the years of follow-up. And you see they're going more than a decade. And they had six cities, um, so each city is a separate line. And what you see on the y-axis is the probability of survival. So we start off in year zero where the probability of survival is 100% because a precondition for enrollment in the studies, you had to be alive at the beginning of the study. Okay, fair enough. And then as the study goes on, this is a large cohort of thousands of people, people started dying. And what they observed is that in the dirtier cities, the death rate was higher than the cleaner cities. And that comes out in the slope of this line. And when they plotted that death rate on the y-axis versus the concentration, so here's a concentration of fine particles, or PM2.5, particles that are smaller than two and a half microns in diameter. On this axis is the death rate uh, ratioed to the cleanest city, or normalized to the cleanest city. So the cleanest city gets a value of one, and everything is ratioed relative to that. 
there's two things I'll point out about this finding. One is just how straight that line is. It's a really clean, clear relationship, shockingly clear how strong is that relationship between air pollution and mortality in the Harvard Six City study. And the second thing that's really surprising is the value of these y-axis, the, that you're getting a 10% or 20% increase in mortality rates because of the air pollution concentrations that were there, surprisingly large. <clears throat> and, and actually, last one, one more thing to point out is, remember from the London smog, we thought, well, if we just keep the concentrations low enough, then we'll be safe. And what you don't see here, this is kind of a straight line, what you don't see is a safe concentration that shows up. More pollution is worse, less pollution is better, but there's no concentration that we can identify as safe. It's all normalized to the cleanest city here. <clears throat> and then the last bit of background, this is uh, from a project called the uh, Global Burden of Disease. That is an effort by researchers around the world. It's a major collaboration from probably hundreds of researchers to catalog what are the root causes of, of death and disease. And here I'm showing the death numbers. Um, so this is in mortality uh, in millions per year. Uh, and I'll point out the two air pollution um, examples up here, household air pollution. Now the colors are for uh, middle and low income and high income. So this is mostly an issue in middle and low income, not in high income countries. This is cooking with solid fuels, um, agricultural waste, cow dung, um, coal, whatever fuels are cheap or free, uh, leading to very high concentrations indoors. <coughs> and then ambient outdoor air pollution, uh, or ambient PM, particulate matter. You'll see that there's some blue up there and some parts that are not blue, so this is an issue globally. Um, and it's also an issue in high income countries. And both of these are on top 10 lists of global killers. So they're, they're a major attributor, contributor to death and disease globally. So if we wanted to improve upon this, these health effects, <clears throat> we would typically track this emissions to health effects paradigm. I'm gonna step back here and take a drink, excuse me. We're starting from the emission source, going through concentrations to exposures and intakes. This is a causal chain we would typically, typically track if we wanted to understand how reductions in emissions would address these health effects. <clears throat> in my own work, I focus here in the middle, an exposure assessment. Um, so I use a variety of methods. Um, one is direct measurement. These are um, some people in Jakarta, Indonesia, carrying around a backpack. You can make measurements of air pollution, um, come back to the lab and either weigh some filters or download some real-time data to understand um, what concentrations people were exposed to when they went about their day. We use satellite-based estimates. There's satellites overhead, and we can <clears throat> get information about air pollution based on those satellite measurements. And then lastly, modeling. There's all kinds of models. There's mechanistic models. There's empirical models. Um, what I'm showing here is, in, is a type of model called land use regression, uh, which has good spatial precision. We use various models to understand air pollution concentrations, how they vary in space and in time, <clears throat> and for the mechanistic models, how those concentrations might change if we reduce the emissions. So I'm, I'm based here on exposures. I want to go upstream uh, in my research and look at what happens if you change the emissions. How does that shift exposures? And then also downstream in this causal chain, what would be the changes to health as a result of shifting those exposures? So with that, here's my outline for today, the three topics I want to talk about. One is urban design, how a city is laid out. For example, sprawl versus infill development, the size and shape of a city. Um, and how that influences air pollution. And I'll talk about some evidence from satellites for that. The second topic is uh, indoor pollution in rural India. Uh, again, from, from solid fuel combustion. And I just mentioned how high are the, the, the health effects matter quite large. Um, and there we're looking at an intervention study that aims to reduce the emissions and exposures. And the third topic is uh, looking at transportation, biofuels versus fossil fuels. <clears throat> and what would be the air pollution impacts from, from those two different fuel alternatives. A theme throughout all of these, and I'll come to this explicitly at the end, is environmental justice. Who is more exposed to air pollution, who's less exposed, and how would those disparities shift as we were to increase or decrease the emissions? And so I'll close the talk with a few comments about environmental justice explicitly. Just a quick question. Yeah. At least in New York City, there's a lot of attention paid, in addition to transportation, to heating fuels. So you have all these big buildings that are heated with low-grade heating oil. Okay. Um, I guess I'd say in a dense environment, well, one metric I look at is intake fraction, what fractions of the emissions are inhaled. Um, in general, you want your heating emissions to go outdoors, so the, 
Um, exposures might be similar if they're dense in a dense environment. Um, if you have indoor exposures as well or indoor emissions, and that could potentially increase if you're talking about kind of a single family dwelling. If you don't have that in modern cities. Right. And in, in a high rise, typically you'd expect it to be separated from the people. So from that standpoint, the, uh, the exposure to those emissions could be broadly similar. <clears throat> you might have very different emissions. Um, in some cases, you might be able to emit from the top of a tall building as opposed to ground level, and that can make quite a big difference. That's one potential difference. Um, but emissions near people is the name of the game, and so if you have emissions in dense urban environments, those are going to be likely important emissions from the standpoint of public health. <clears throat> so let me talk about this, move on to the first one, which is urban design. Uh, and I'll start with a, a picture from my PhD dissertation. Um, I was taking a class in urban design from Bob Severo, and we were learning about infill development that one of the kind of mantras of, of good urban design is to increase population density in certain ways. And I was studying exposures. And the challenge is if you put people closer together, well, the, the benefit is that people may drive less for a lot of reasons. Um, they don't have to get, they don't have um, as far to get to where they're going. Um, there might be more public transportation. There might be more disincentives to driving, like more congestion or higher parking fees. So there's, there's a bunch of reasons why added density may reduce the vehicle miles traveled per person per day. But from an exposure standpoint, by increasing density, you're also putting people in closer proximity to those now reduced emissions. And so the question is kind of which, which one wins? And, and this was um, some modeling to look at that, kind of very, very uh, simple and transparent modeling. So here's my city. Um, it's a, a, a flat um, square. Everybody drives the same amount. Everyone is, breathes the same amount of air pollution. Um, and we can look what happens as we add population and, and force them to do infill development or let the city expand, um, or if the city expands but at constant density. Uh, and so what you see here, from doing this kind of analysis, you can represent those changes in your city as partial derivatives and apply those partial derivatives to your mass balance equations. And what you get from this kind of an exercise is uh, if by increasing density people drive only a little bit less, then you would probably increase your exposures because you haven't reduced the emissions enough to compensate for the added proximity. Whereas if by increasing density, people drive a lot less, then you can more than compensate for the added proximity, and you might see a net benefit to air pollution. So I was curious after doing this modeling work, what happens empirically? What, what do we observe? Um, and for that, I, I got into looking at the satellite data. data. So um, we had a database of about 90 cities um, shown up here and overlaid in color are the satellite-based estimates of ground-level NO2 air pollution. And we have information about each city, such as the population, um, the GDP per capita, and then these two measures of urban form, which I'll talk more about in, in the next slide, contiguity and compactness. Um, and I'll show some examples of what this means, but one is kind of connectedness and one is circularity. So here's one example city, uh, which is uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, where I live. Um, here's the satellite um, imagery of the city. Um, here, looking at kind of built up versus not built up areas. Here's the satellite-based uh, estimates of NO2 concentration. And then this is just overlaying these two to look at kind of where the concentrations are throughout the city. Yes, sir? Can you say just a little bit about sort of how you see methane and air um, in the NO2 estimates from satellites going before moving on? I know it's a big sure. Sure, um, I can point you to our articles on this. In general, the satellite does a pretty good job at picking up spatial patterns of air pollution. So, uh, for example, showing that this is the urban area and this is the rural area. Um, it doesn't do a great job of getting the um, absolute concentration. But if you need the, the relative concentration, um, it does a pretty good job. And that's kind of what we need here. Yes, sir? Um, so for this analysis, I'll get to that when you see the results in a minute. It's mostly NO2 because <clears throat> there's really good spatial precision with the satellite estimates of NO2. Um, we, I'll show this in, in a minute, but we also look at PM 2.5 and ozone. Um, but the satellite estimates are based on NO2. So here's an example of, of urban form. I picked out four cities from the database uh, showing the variety of contiguity and compactness. So uh, Contiguity is how contiguous is the built-up growth. And what you'll notice is in the, in the less contiguous column, a greater fraction of the total land area is outside of the urban core. 
Whereas over here, there's more contiguous growth. That means that a greater fraction of the built up area is contiguous with, is, is spatially connected with that urban core. So another way to say it would be how patchy is the growth? Is there leapfrog growth? This is kind of more leapfrog growth, and this is more contiguous growth over here. Uh, and as I'll show in the next slide, this is the one that ends up being a statistically significant predictor of NO2 concentrations. The other uh, metric we looked at is compactness, which is uh, kind of a measure of circularity. So these are more compact, more circular cities, and these are less compact, more cigar-shaped cities. And we found that that's not statistically um, significantly associated with NO2 air pollution. So you run these models, these are linear regression models, and you get results that look kind of like this. Uh, so here we have income, um, and you see this kind of curved response, which is what you'd expect from the environmental Kuznets curve if you believe that theory for urban air pollution, um, that uh, as income increases, air pollution gets worse, but only up to a point, and then it kind of turns over. Um, bigger cities have worse air pollution. Um, here's my two urban form metrics. Uh, continuity is the one that was statistically significant. Uh, meaning that this slope is statistically different from zero. Compactness was not statistically significant, meaning this is not statistically different from zero. Uh, zero would mean there's no impact of uh, compactness on air pollution. Um, and then dilution rate, not surprisingly, the more dilution you have in your city, this is the kind of local meteorology, leads to cleaner air. Um, this slide down here, this is a recreation of this one up here, um, but all I've done is taken the, the bottom half of the data and just drawn a straight line up. Um, and, and the reason I do this is this is sort of a, a theoretical line of what would happen if, if we were to continue to increase our emissions per income at the same rate as in the bottom half of the data? And what you see over here on the right side of the data, these are you know, kind of US cities or, or high income cities, there's an order of magnitude difference between uh, extending this slope, this theoretical level, and what we actually observe. And that order of magnitude difference is the air pollution control that we have bought. It's the catalytic converters and the scrubbers and the other technologies we have that reduce emissions and lead to this cleaner level, um, even for higher um, economic throughput. I'm wondering if you could say something about how uh, geophysical constraints might both affect uh, contiguity and compactness as well as um, you know, concentrations, and whether that was controlled for here or whether we So we don't have data on geophysical constraints, so I can't say something directly about that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that's something you can control for. You could say that might be an underlying mechanism. You could hypothesize that that's a mechanism for um, what we observe here. Um, I mean, the standard urban planning hypothesis would be that if you have less patchy growth, then people don't have to drive as far to get to where they're going and all those other things I mentioned. But you could certainly offer uh, other explanations. Um, certainly, if you had major um, topography um, to the level that changed dilution rates, um, that would show up here, yeah. So to put these results kind of in, in, in words, um, a one standard deviation increase in contiguity was associated with a 24% reduction in NO2. Uh, more populous cities tend to have worse air quality, but the NO2 increase associated with a 10% increase in population may be offset by moderate, by 4% increase in urban continuity. So we use this as kind of among the few examples of empirical evidence that urban form can matter in uh, predicting concentrations of outdoor air pollution. Uh, this was for a global database of cities. Um, we also looked at this in the US only, and we have a very you know, different sets of data for the US. So we have census data to know where people live instead of based on satellites. Um, and we have the EPA monitors to look up air pollution levels. Similar study um, based on different databases. Um, and what we found there is that uh, increased population density is correlated with um, increased concentrations of the pollutants we looked at, PM2.5 and ozone. That's perhaps not surprising. Um, however, once you fix the overall average population density of an urban area, if you hold that fixed, if you sh uh, change where those people live within the city, um, and our metric here is population centrality, I mean, to what extent do the people live near the urban core? If you increase population centrality, have more people living near the urban core, that's associated with improvements in air pollution. And the magnitude is large. It's, it's larger than I would have thought. It's, it's comparable to, you know, if you look at the variability among cities from uh, this change in population centrality, it's comparable to the variability by meteorology. So that suggests that it's um, you know, an important variable. Um, if I wanted to be more provocative, I'd say, well, this, this is evidence that we could 
potentially use shifts in urban form as a tool to improve air pollution. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's certainly something I think of, and, and it's, it's certainly not one of the tools that air quality engineers typically think about right now. Um, I don't have this up here, but another thing we looked at was uh, how much public transportation was available, and we found that more public transportation actually led to improvements in PM 2.5, which is uh, a reassuring finding. So these articles are both out, um, and we're going to continue to work in this area. So our next steps, um, one is looking at a larger sample size, and we had about 90 cities globally in the previous analysis, and we uh, are moving towards a much larger database um, to kind of look at some of the, the subtleties you can pick up with a larger database. Um, and then for the U.S., um, a few things, improve spatial precision, um, and I'll say more about that on the next slide. Um, we want to look at environmental justice issues, which I'll kind of come to at the very end. We want to include those here. And then panel data. So the results that I showed so far were really cross-sectional. Um, and we looked at, we'd like to look at how changes in urban form over time have been correlated with changes in air pollution over time. So kind of on this, on this goal of improved spatial precision, <clears throat> I'm showing here the two data sources I mentioned for our prior analyses um, for Minneapolis-St. Paul. So one were the satellite data. Um, and we do some modeling to convert the satellite estimates of column total into ground level concentrations. And the spatial resolution here is about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. That's the finest spatial resolution. Um, down here, these are the regulatory monitors. We have three of them. Um, and this is a kind of in, uh, interpolation of those. And you can see this is a pretty boring picture. They agree reasonably well. Um, that's, that's good. That means that they're probably picking up the regional average concentration but they lend no information about spatial variability within, within the city. So we wanted to develop an approach that would let us look at some of the spatial variability w within a city. Um, and this is quite a common tool now in environmental health is an approach called land use regression, uh, which uses observations um, and the land uses. Where are the roads? Where are the what are the elevations? Where are industrial areas, high and low population density, those sorts of factors to make estimates of air pollution with high spatial precision. Um, and so what we've done here is a national land use regression. We include our satellite-based estimates, uh, and that's, that's quite convenient because they, they provide spatially uniform coverage. Um, we also use the EPA monitors, and that kind of folds into developing the land use regression. Um, and that lets us make spatially precise predictions of NO2 air pollution at ground level. Um, our estimates uh, are about 0.1 kilometer spatial resolution. The map you're seeing right here is we have estimates for uh, each census block in the US. So that's, the census block is the smallest um, spatial delineation that census does. <clears throat> I'm showing one city over here, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, on our estimates by census block, and then just a line that I drew arbitrarily across the city, and we look up concentrations as you, as you go across. And what you can see is we get the urban to rural um, gradients, um, and then there's, you know, each time that line passes a road or a park or whatever, this kind of jogs up and down. So it performs the way we'd expect. Um, I, I guess I'd say overall the model performs better than I might have expected. Um, we've poked and prodded at this model in various ways to see how well it performs. We um, hold aside some data and build the model on other data, and there, you know, there's various ways of testing it, um, and it seems relatively robust to the different um, ways that we've constrained the model and tried to test it. Um, and so we think this is a reasonably reliable estimate, um, a model to estimate with good spatial precision NO2 concentrations throughout the U.S. Um, I'll come back to this um, at the end of my talk to, to talk about environmental justice. Um, with that, let me move on to the um, indoor air pollution uh, aspect and, and just quote the statistic. I showed the numbers globally. Here's a number for India specifically, um, that about 500,000 deaths per year are attributable to biomass use in India. Um, it's an enormous, enormous number, obviously. It's about 5% of the national burden of disease. And we, like many people, wondered what can we do about that? And so uh, we have a cook stove intervention um, study that, that we carried out in southern India, in Karnataka. Um, we're looking at a specific stove, which is called a chulika. Uh, it's a rocket stove. Um, so uh, this is a picture of the new stove. Here's a kind of traditional stove, what we call a three-stone fire. So there's, in this case, kind of three knobs. Um, very convenient. This goes back to caveman times. Um, it's, it's very easy and inexpensive. The wood, the, the wood goes underneath. Um, there's a wide opening here. And in this intervention, the traditional stove was removed. Um, in this case, you can see the hearth was um, completely removed and broken. Um, and then a new hearth was placed, and it has this space where the new stove can, can sit in there. So here's the Chulika. It's manufactured in Bangalore. Um, it's an enclosed stove. It's not as open as a traditional stove. There's this heat shield here. There's also a grate that the wood sits on so the air can get in um, underneath the wood. So you have um, higher fuel efficiency. 
uh, meaning you get more uh, energy per kilogram of wood, and you have higher thermal transfer efficiency. So more of the energy generated goes into your pot. When you bring these stoves into the lab, they look great. And we're, I have some statistics up there at top. Um, the thermal efficiency is about three times higher in the lab um, for the new, the new stove, the Chulika, versus the traditional stove. Um, and you save quite a bit of wood, a two-fold increase. And we were curious how this looked in the field. <clears throat> so we went to India. Um, we did a randomized control trial in the field. Um, we went to one village in northern Karnataka. Um, there were about 200 households in the village. Um, we did measurements in all the households of uh, some health attributes, like blood pressure. Uh, we measured indoors and outdoors. Um, and we measured in plume, um, so we can get some emissions estimates. Uh, and then randomly, half of the households got the new stoves. We left them there for a couple months for people to get used to the stoves, and we came back and measured in all of the households. The households that got the stoves and the households that didn't get the stoves. It's really important to measure in the households that didn't get the stoves also because they are our controls. They're our mental model for what would have happened had the interve intervention households not received their intervention. So here's just a picture from the field. There's two boxes. Um, <clears throat> this bottom box, you can see there's a line that goes up, and this goes up to the chimney. So we're measuring directly in the plume. plume. With this bottom box, all of our air pollution equipment is inside here. Um, and this one here has just an inlet valve uh, kind of at breathing height to measure what people would be breathing as they're cooking. Um, there's, a, there's a mesh kind of covering this inlet to prevent insects from getting in. Um, we learned the need for that one the hard way. Um, and you know, I'll just mention, these are challenging measurements to make in rural India. There's no um, hardware stores nearby. Um, there's the, the conditions are hot and dusty and bumpy, and that's hard on the equipment, and it's hard on the researchers who are there to make measurements pre-sun up, pre-dawn, when people are doing cooking, um, and late at night when people come back to the fields and, and do cooking. So um, these measurements are, are hard fought and hard won. Uh, each piece of data is, is worth quite a bit. We ran into a bunch of issues that we didn't expect when we were out there. Um, and one of them is, is shown in this picture. Um, and even paying, if you've been paying attention to the study design I mentioned, you might be looking at this picture and saying, I can ask you, what's wrong with this picture? Um, we should not be able to have taken this picture. I don't know how many of you can identify this, but you might be asking yourself, well, is this, is this an intervention or a non-intervention household? Um, really, all the households, this is, this is after the intervention, they should either have one kind of stove or the other kind of stove. Um, and this is a, a household that has both kinds of stoves, the new stove on the left and the traditional stove on the right. And we're working with an NGO that's um, a, a pretty good NGO. They're, they're in this community on a near daily basis. Um, they're doing the study. They're collaborating with people from outside of India. They're telling the people, please follow the protocol. You're in the intervention household. Please use the new stove only, not the old stove. And here's a household that, despite this request from the NGO, um, has still elected to have their old stove. Well, I mean, any, any guesses as to why this is? And, and those people in the audience who, who study this topic, um, the new stove is more efficient. Um, it, it burns hotter which is good for some foods and not for others. And, and in this community, um, it's great for cooking rice and vegetables, uh, but people have roti, um, flat bread, with every meal. And many people found it challenging to cook the roti on the hotter stove without burning it. Um, and so many people elected to go to get the old stove back, then you have two burners. This is no different than you or I. Right? So <clears throat> in your household, when you got a microwave oven, you probably didn't throw away your range top oven. And then you got uh, a toaster oven, and a coffee pot and a waffle iron and whatever else are in your kitchens, with each new technology, you didn't throw away the old technologies. They each satisfy kind of a niche cooking need, and it partially adds to and partially substitutes for the cooking energy demand you had from your old technologies. The same thing is happening here. The newer stove is, runs a little bit differently. In this case, it, it runs hotter. And so people would rather have these two technologies, um, which serve different niche needs instead of having just one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we don't have a picture of it. It, it. it varied. So in some cases, there's zero chimney. It's just, just to the inside room. In this one, actually in both of these pictures, this picture, um, yeah, so this picture, you can kind of see it. But those stoves are set in a little bit. And it's kind of over a hood. Like you kind of imagine like an old style um, fireplace in many of the quaint Yale buildings, right? There's sort of this large fireplace where you could almost step in. Yeah, and so there's a, there is kind of a hood chimney. So I'd say there's a range from some have no chimneys and some have a mild hood 
you know, a little bit that, that vents up, and some have a pretty good hood and the, and the fire is in it so that, certainly not all the smoke, um, but a fair bit would go up the chimney. But you have a lot of variation. You have variation in that, yeah, absolutely. Um, we had another of, of other issues that we ran into, I'd be happy to talk about, that, that we didn't expect, um, that we learned by doing this in the field, which we would not have learned um, just by using these stoves in the lab. So <clears throat> we went into this thinking we had two kinds of um, subpopulations, uh, the cases and the controls, and it turns out that we have three subpopulations, um, the uh, non-intervention and then the intervention who followed protocol and the intervention who did not follow protocol. Um, so we're still analyzing these data, but, but here's some early results. I'm looking at PM 2.5 on the left um, and black carbon on the right. Um, in, in these black box pots, so the bottom is the 10th uh, percentile, the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, the median, 75th and 90th, and the diamonds are the mean value. Um, and what you can see is if you go from the controls to the, well, actually, let me do the black carbon first because that's easiest. These are not statistically different, so we'd not see a big change in black carbon. That's an easier story. Um, on, on this side, going from the controls to two chulicas, we do see a statistically significant drop in average concentration. Um, you'll see that a, a, among these plots, the interquartile range is, changes a bit, um, not a lot, a lot. The bigger change is in the half of the data which is outside of the interquartile range. So here you're seeing this kind of lower tail. This, these are changes in concentration, post minus pre. So we would love to see all these concentrations be below zero, meaning an improvement in concentrations. Uh, many of these are above zero, meaning an increase in concentrations. Um, and, and that includes our controls. So in many of the control households, concentrations were higher after than before. Who knows why? There could be any number of reasons. Maybe the wood was wetter in the next season when we came back. Maybe there were more festivals. Maybe food was more plentiful. There could be a near infinite list of possible explanations. That's why we have to have the controls to see, that's, again, this is our mental model of what would have happened had we not done the intervention. And so even though here the average concentration went up, if this is greater than zero, it didn't go up as much as in the controls. And so I would look at that and claim, well, that's probably a success on the part of the intervention relative to the controls. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And they're co-emitted, but maybe not related to the different Sure, right. Do you, the um, you have different combustion conditions. I mean, the, the, what fraction of the particles are elemental carbon or black carbon will vary depending on the combustion conditions. Um, one anecdote we heard a lot, and I don't have specific data on this, but we, we heard this anecdotally many, many times, was people would say with the old fire, um, you could just sort of put a bunch of wood in and go about and do some other things, and then come back 10 minutes later and, and push the wood in and, and, and then go away. Whereas for the new one, it goes through the wood a lot faster. There's a really narrow opening, so you can only put a few, a smaller number of pieces of wood in there, and, and they go faster, so you have to kind of stay there a little bit more and feed them in. So it's just different combustion conditions. We'd expect um, black carbon, uh, com, you know, may vary differently from PM. Um, if, if we combine the two chulica and the mixed stoves populations, which would be kind of an intent to treat uh, analysis, we still get a statistically significant reduction. It's not quite as statistically significant. I think we have our p-value is 0.7 instead of 0.03. Um, so this points out that you know, one, a really important factor is whether people follow protocol. Now I mentioned that this NGO is in the community on a near daily basis. So in this particular intervention, um, you know, these we had roughly a, a third or so uh, in this group relative to, of, of the total population. I would imagine in a different intervention, we might not have quite as many people following protocol if, if their NGO is not quite as engaged as we had here. Yeah. Just, um, you could speak about when were these two uh, data sets taken? What time of the year? Um, the, con the prior intervention was in our fall, so September, October, November, and the post-intervention was kind of our late spring. Um, mm, yeah, April, May. So I was wondering, um, generally, if it's, if it feels like it was the time was, it was winter, you know, October, November, uh, that would also mean that there's more need for heat versus <coughs> Yeah. Right, so um, this is in Northern Karnataka. My understanding is there's not really a, a need for heating in this particular village. Um, the study that Rob and I are doing, we're gonna go back to this part of India and then also go to the north, to Kulu Valley, where there definitely is a heating and a cooling season. Um, but th that w absolutely would play a role. 
my understanding is it doesn't here. There's not really heating. So it's not heating, but generally if you're like looking for low cost of heat or low cost of water. Oh, heat. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, from talking to people, of course, you know, most people don't care about the health impacts, the villagers that we talk to, um, but they do care about the smoke. And so if we go in and say, well, this stove or, you know, having a chimney should reduce the smoke, that's an irritant. They would be perfectly happy to reduce the amount of smoke. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> right, that's a concern. We don't have any data on that. I mean, you know, they're kind of, if, as they move about, to, most of these are one or two room households, and so actually observing how close are they to the fire for what percentage of the time um, would be a great research project, and we don't have data on that. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you could really ask a person that other than anecdotally what their memory is, but um, you get a huge bias of what they think the right answer is. You could measure, but we, we didn't kind of put a tr tracer on them. So, um, you know, I guess w I'm continuing to work on this. Um, it's an important topic from the standpoint of global health. Um, I don't feel like we've cracked this nut. I'm not really sure what the solutions are. There are some stoves out there that may reduce emissions. Um, you know, we've done one study and there are other studies out there and okay, so our sample size is, um, you know, 100 to 200 households, but really our sample size is one village. And we ran into certain issues in this one village, but I'd love to see this kind of study happen in 10 other villages because we'll probably run into 10 other issues in those other villages as, as we implement these stoves or kind of the next um, stoves that are promised, the Phillips fan stove or other ones that are out there. Um, but it's pretty clear what we see in the lab is really different from what happens in the field. We get all kinds of surprises in the field. So with that, let me move on to the, the third topic, um, which is on biofuels. And of course, um, we have a lot of societal benefits from transportation. Um, <clears throat> I get a chance to come here to FES, which is great for me. Um, and there are all kinds of, um, there, there's some downsides to transportation as well. Um, and for that reason, many people are searching for alternatives to the petroleum that runs much of our transportation infrastructure. Here's some estimates, just to put some numbers in this from Mark DeLucci, um, estimating that the air pollution, uh, human health impacts from transportation are among the dominant externalities uh, from transportation, meaning um, impacts that are not included in the market transactions for consuming transportation um, on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars per year from transportation in the US. <clears throat> we also have a goal in the US of environmental justice. Um, and here, let me just read, read this quote. This is from an executive order that Bill Clinton signed uh, quite a while ago now, um, saying, and I'll just read the part in blue, uh, that each federal agency shall make achieving environmental justice part of its mission. This is something that we're, we're tasked, our federal government is tasked with doing, um, and I think that's remained um, an unmet challenge so far. It's something that we're still trying to figure out. How should our federal agencies try to address um, this executive order? So, you know, overall, we're trying to pose the question, um, are biofuels and other alternative fuels better for society than the fossil fuels which they would displace? That's the big picture question, and we're looking at the air pollution aspects of that because um, that seems to be a really important part of that bigger picture. So we have a number of possible alternatives. Um, we have grid-independent gasoline electric hybrid vehicles, like the, Pri the non-plug-in Prius. Um, we have compressed natural gas, um, diesel vehicles, ethanol vehicles, or E10 vehicles that are using ethanol from corn grain, which is how we get our ethanol currently, um, and kind of next generation corn stover. Stover is the part of the um, corn that's left over after you take away the cobs on the outside. It's currently what, what's left over. That's kind of the idea for next generation biofuels is corn stover ethanol. And then electric vehicles, and of course it depends on where you get the electricity from. So the um, US grid average, coal, natural gas, um, corn stover, you can co-fire co uh, corn stover in uh, coal electricity generation. Uh-oh, oh, here we go, I've got a lecture now, thanks for talking about that. Um, and then the last um, electricity is uh, wind wave or solar power, kind of the renewable energy. So again, we're gonna go back to this causal chain. We track the emissions, the exposures, and the health effects. Um, in this case, we also have a life cycle analysis. So we're looking not only at the tailpipe emissions, but all the way uh, upstream. So to produce the biofuel requires um, growing the crops. You have to run tractors, which requires diesel fuel. You need fertilizers, um, which take electricity to generate, and so on. We're looking um, back up the supply chain for the biofuels and also for the petroleum fuels to refine those fuels. <clears throat> 
what that means in practice is we have uh, literally hundreds of different processes that are involved in these fuel life cycles. And for each one, we need uh, spatial disaggregation to know where those emissions occurred. So here I'm showing three of the processes. Um, one are the vehicle tailpipes. Um, so here's a map of the US, and you can see that we spatially, um, spatially disaggregate those or allocate those to where the tailpipes are, which is the cities and the major roadways. Um, we also have to temporally disaggregate these to run in air dispersion models. Um, so we have by month of year and by time of day um, when we think these emissions happen. There's also some chemical disaggregation I'm, I'm not getting into here. Um, okay, so two other ones, fertilizer nitrification. So this is kind of where the fertilizers would, would be applied and would impact the environment where those emissions are. Um, and then coal mining and, and coal cleaning, which happens at the site. So here, this is where the coal mines are and where the emissions would occur from these. So we have for each of these processes upstream where those emissions happen. Um, and then we, we use those emissions in an air dispersion model. And I'll show you two results today. Um, one is for a national modeling that we've done. So here's our, here's our domain. These are 12 kilometer by 12 kilometer grid cells. Um, which for this kind of dispersion model, this is an Eulerian grid model, that's pretty spatially precise for this kind of national domain, and we simulate a whole year. Um, and then I'm also gonna show results from uh, one uh, nested grid we've done in Southern California. So we, we zoom in here to two kilometer by two kilometer grid cells. Um, so the prior uh, example would be the national impacts of national fuel policies, and this one would be the local impacts of national fuel policies. So I have an animation. So this is what this looks like in the air dispersion model. Uh, we have our base case in the upper left. This is national uh, emissions inventory. Um, we're simulating a whole year. And then for each of these scenarios, we say there's a 10% increase in vehicle miles traveled. What would happen if the 10% were met by each of these different technologies? And here I'm just showing the same technologies that you, that you saw previously. You'll notice the ones in red are electric vehicles from coal um, and corn ethanol. Um, and the cleanest one is uh, wind, wave, and solar electric vehicles. And then we run the same thing for Los Angeles. Um, now the biggest difference you'll notice here is that for Los Angeles, what really shows up are the, the scenarios with tailpipe emissions. The scenarios with electric vehicles, there's not much of a difference. I mean, there's some impact because you have the whole kind of life cycle. There's things you have to do. There's transportation and whatnot. It's not zero, but most of the electricity generation happens outside of this air basin. So there's not that much of a difference locally from the electric vehicle scenarios. It's really the tailpipe emissions that we see. So here are the annual average values. Again, the ones that light up are um, electric vehicles from coal, um, electric vehicles from ethanol. I'm sorry, this is cut off. I don't know if there's a way to adjust the screen size. The person who's taping, are you able to adjust the screen size so that, no, no. okay, all right, it is what it is. Um, there's some blue here with, with corn, with silver ethanol because there's co-products um, in the production of ethanol and, and you can use that to offset um, electricity generation. So we use that as negative emissions from the electric grid. Uh, so we're kind of properly accounting for the co-products that come from silver ethanol. Um, and then again, here's from um, Southern California, and what you really see are the differences amongst the tailpipe emissions. So let me convert these scenarios into risks. Um, each dot up here is one of the scenarios, one of the fuel options. On the x-axis here is overall population risk. So we're looking at PM 2.5 uh, and ozone from all these scenarios. Um, on the y-axis, uh, the label that's cut off um, is the difference between low-income non-white and high-income white risks. So if you have um, dots that are above zero, that would be sort of the conventional environmental justice issue. That would mean that low-income non-whites have higher exposures uh, than do high-income whites. So this is kind of conventional environmental justice. And this would be sort of reverse environmental justice. It's the opposite of what you might expect. So what we see, for example, uh, here's gasoline. Um, now, gasoline, there's some, that's kind of our, our comparison, because right now most cars use gasoline. And so everything we compare against gasoline, and what you see is there's some scenarios that um, on the x-axis, the overall population risk, some of the scenarios do worse in gasoline. Um, that includes electric vehicles from coal, which is our worst scenario. That's consistent with the maps I just showed. Um, electric vehicles from the overall average, which uses quite a lot of coal, um, and uh, corn grain ethanol. Again, those are the ones that, that stood out in red on the maps I showed. Um, and then electric vehicles from wind, wave, and solar is the cleanest one. So those are the, the, the x-axis values. In terms of the y-axis values, you'll notice that gasoline has the highest value that's up there. 
So the environmental justice concerns, we might say from, from this kind of analysis, are the highest for gasoline. The other fuels have lower disparities, that is lower environmental justice concerns. Um, and then you get this case of coal, which is down kind of strongly negative, because coal is rural. So the, he, in this map, I'm combining, or in this plot, I'm combining uh, race and income. And of course, we can disaggregate that. Um, and let me do that just to, to illustrate coal. So here is low income minus high income risk. Um, and all these dots line up a much closer to the zero line. So that suggests that what's really dominating this is, is racial differences and not income differences. And here we have differences by race only, and you see quite a spread on the y-axis. So it's really race that's, that's driving uh, what you see up here when you combine them. Now the coal case is sort of interesting because they're pretty rural. Um, those rural emissions, on average, overall in aggregate, um, are, are breathed by um, whites and, who are low income. Those are the rural exposures. And so here when you look at income, you get kind of this coal is above the line, so it's more, it's exposing more non, uh, excuse me, lower income than higher income. And we look at race, it's more to um, whites than to non-whites. And in, in the aggregate, you get coal, which is sort of below this zero line. Um, we did the same map for Los Angeles, um, and in that, in that configuration, all the electric vehicle scenarios are kind of in this one clump because there's not much of a difference amongst them, and they're kind of near the zero, zero point, not at it, but they're much closer to it. Um, and what you see is kind of the, amongst the non-electric vehicles, the vehicles that have tailpipe emissions, there's a greater disparity. Again, gasoline has the highest um, disparity, the highest environmental justice concern based on this metric. So uh, let me turn then just to this environmental justice issue. Um, which is looking at who's breathing more air pollution and who's breathing less air pollution. Um, these are some results we have from Southern California. Just to illustrate this, um, we're looking at the four different subpopulations that were in the census there, whites, Hispanics, African Americans, and Asians, and Pacific Islanders. And for each subpopulation, um, here I'm looking at the median intake, this would be, let's say, in, in mass per day or mass per year, relative to the overall population median. Um, and these are three pollutants, uh, ozone in white, uh, diesel particles, and benzene. And what you can see is differences amongst pollutants and differences amongst subpopulations. So for these two pollutants, diesel and benzene, whites have lower exposures and non-whites have higher exposures. And for ozone, the reverse holds. For ozone, whites have higher exposures and non-whites have lower exposures. Why? You guys study air pollution. Why, why might that be? Don't be shy. Yeah, yeah. So why is that? Why does that show this difference? That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Is, ozone is a. Um, I mostly agree with that. I think even if you didn't have the trees in the suburbs, you still have the ozone. But it's, a, but it's absolutely, it's in the right direction, which is um, these two pollutants are primary pollutants, meaning they're emitted directly. So the high concentrations are downtown and near roadways. And ozone is a secondary pollutant. It forms in the atmosphere. It takes a while for those chemical reactions to occur from the precursor emissions. The high concentrations are not near the sources, not downtown and not near roadways. Um, and that's where you have more whites and, and fewer non-whites. So these differences are exactly what you'd expect from the, the spatial patterns of where people live and where these uh, pollutants are higher or lower concentrations. This is for um, one urban area, and there have been several studies documenting this kind of impact for specific urban areas. Um, we've also kind of looked across the whole U.S., so I'm, I'm returning to this land use regression model, which let, let us look uh, universally across the U.S. Um, at all urban areas and rural areas. And so what I'm showing here is uh, the average uh, household income on this level. Um, and the NO2 concentration for whites and non-whites in large urban areas, uh, medium urban areas, and small urban areas. Oh, I've probably got another warning that I'm supposed to give my lecture here. Let's see if I can turn this off. I apologize for that. Um, interestingly, when you combine all the urban areas, it's, you get a confusing picture. You, you, you don't get much of a pattern by income um, because People who are very affluent are more likely to live in high, uh, in large urban areas than in small urban areas. So to see this kind of a picture, you have to act, you have to separate out the large, small, medium, and small urban areas. Uh, in the large urban areas, um, 
race and income are um, equal in importance in predicting concentrations. Um, and in the uh, medium, excuse me, I'm sorry, in the large urban area, race is more important than income, uh, whereas for these two urban areas, race and income are about equally important. <clears throat> so for this last bit, I want to um, make an argument that these are kind of four metrics that we should care about in air quality management. If we're trying to reduce emissions to address air pollution, um, here's four things we should care about. One is the impact, the total health impact. Um, and a metric I'll use for that is mean intake. How much pollution are people inhaling? Another topic is efficiency. We want to go after the sources that matter most from the standpoint of air pollution, exposure and health. And the metric I'll use there is intake fraction. What fraction of emissions are inhaled? All else being equal, you'd want to target the sources with a higher intake fraction than with a, lowest intake, with a lower intake fraction in order to get a larger exposure and health benefit per emission reduction. Uh, the third topic is equality. Now, environmental equality and environmental justice are often used interchangeably, but they get at different issues. Equality is a more mathematical concept. There are metrics that describe deviations from perfect equality, meaning we all breathe the same amount. So there's things like the Gini coefficient and the Atkinson coefficient, which is what I'll use here, and there's other coefficients for um, how disparate are the exposures. But that doesn't get at who's breathing more pollution and who's breathing less pollution. And so for that kind of environmental justice aspect, um, here I look at high socioeconomic status versus low socioeconomic status. And I'll continue using low income non-whites versus high income whites to get at that disparity among uh, demographic attributes. And I have a few slides on what we can do with these four metrics, but, but the main point is that we should care about all four. If we're trying to target the sources that matter most, we should be concerned with all four of these metrics and seek opportunities to address emissions that do a good job for all four of these. So one example that we can do is, is make maps across the US. So here's a map of two of those four, the equity and the justice. Um, and we could use this kind of map to target, um, you know, if we're at EPA, where are the environmental justice issues largest or smallest? Um, again, th that kind of issue has been investigated at an urban scale, so kind of one city at a time. Um, much more in the literature, but looking comprehensively across the US at where are the, the disparities higher or lower, where is the inequality higher or lower, um, is kind of a new tool and one I think we should be looking at for how can our national environmental justice policy rationally focus on the areas that matter most. <clears throat> we can also zoom in on a specific city. So uh, these are maps from uh, Los Angeles. So the ocean is uh, over here on the left. The land is over here, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, Orange County is here. And what we've done here is look at if we reduce the emissions in certain areas um, throughout, this, throughout this region, what would be the changes in my four metrics? So the areas in red, for example, in, in justice and equality, red uh, and orange would be improvements in those metrics or reductions, improvements in those metrics. Um, and green and yellow would be uh, disbenefits to those metrics. So with these four maps, we can then uh, overlay those four maps. Uh, and then the red spot, so, so here um, each of those four things have uh, different lines, and then we kind of doubled up the density of the lines where, where it matters more. Um, this gray low emissions is where the emissions are near zero, so I kind of grade them in to, so we don't need to consider them. And the area in red is uh, the area where all four of those metrics do especially well. Um, that area in red is about the tenth the size of the London low emission zone. So that floats the policy idea that we could focus on these areas spatially for where are the emissions that have the biggest impact uh, in terms of those four metrics I talked about. So this is a spatial analysis. Um, we've done a similar analysis looking at specific um, emission sources. So here we have on-road, these are diesel particles, on-road, trains, ships, off-road and stationary sources, meaning kind of industrial sources, um, and how would a, a, re a reduction in emissions affect your equality uh, and your justice metric? And it turns out it, it matters whether you frame this in terms of an absolute um, shift in emissions or a relative shift in emissions. So this is um, for, a, for a, let's say, a 10% reduction, and this is per ton per day reduction. Um, and whether it's relative or absolute reductions in, in emissions, you, you see things slightly differently. But the quadrant you'd want to be in is up here, where you have um, improvements to equality and improvements to justice. Uh, and so this is 
based on a similar line of thinking as the map I just showed. The map is purely the, the spatial areas. This is five different sources that have different spatial signatures to where their emissions are. And so we can use this kind of analysis to make the same argument. Which sources should we target? We should target the sources whose em emission reductions would make the biggest improvements in those four metrics. Um, so I, I'll stop there. Um, again, just I'll, I'll end where I started. Uh, my focus is on, on measuring and modeling exposures, looking at where those exposures come from, what would happen if we increased or reduced those emissions, and what would be the exposure and health impacts um, of those shifts. Um, where's the field of air pollution going? You know, where, where is air quality going? I, I'll, I guess I'll close with one note that um, air quality in the U.S., has gotten better over the long term. And I think there's reasonable space for optimism to work in this field. That's one thing I like about this field. In 1970, when the Clean Air Act was passed, air pollution was much, much worse than it is today. Um, essentially, we can get smarter uh, than this problem faster than it gets worse, and, and faster than we grow our economy. At least that's what the evidence suggests from the US in the long term, if you have a long term perspective. There's lots more issues to work on. There's all kinds of new pollutants we have to focus on that we didn't know about before. Um, and there's all kinds of issues working on um, globally, if we take a global perspective instead of a, a local perspective. But I think there is reason for long-term optimism uh, in this field. And that's one thing I've liked about studying this area uh, is the use of this kind of added knowledge to address these problems. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Let me um, thank my co-authors and, and collaborators and graduate students who did all the heavy lifting involved um, in the results I just showed. Um, and I'll end there. Thanks.